before is highly polluted with arsenic and antimony and we've been working it on it um, in it for about the last 10 to 15 years so the fires swept right through this whole river catchment so on that note i'd like you to imagine that you're a first year phd student who's just confirmed your phd um, and the whole PhD was going to be focused on understanding the mobilization of arsenic and antimony in this water system. You're going to be out sampling water all the time through your three years. Then the region's been hit by the worst drought in 100 years and there was no water left to sample. Okay, secondly, I'd like you to imagine next that you're a beekeeper and you've just commenced your PhD also. Um, and you've developed this amazing project to use your bees to understand contaminant exposure effects on colony dynamics. Um, really critical because we were working on PFAS compounds. Then the drought killed off most of the flowering vegetation around your hives and their health depleted significantly. And secondly, the bushfires came through where they were situated and decimated the hives completely. So thirdly, I'd like you lastly to imagine that you're again a first year PhD student who again, you've just done your confirmation and the subject was on microplastics and you were going to understand sources of micro, pro, microplastics that were generated in large recreational gatherings. Then all the events that you had planned to visit and sample were completely canceled for the foreseeable future because of an unprecedented global pandemic, and that's COVID-19. So these are just some of the challenges that our early career researchers up here at UNE have been grappling with over the last couple of years um, and recent times too. And I'm sure there's similar cases across Australia, but some of these are very unique to regional um, uh, environments. So, this picture here, I hope you can see this one. So this, I'm going to use this picture of the amazing epicormic growth that we've been seeing now in the Maclay over the last couple of months as an analogy of what I've seen that our young people have been able to achieve. They've been energetic, creative, resilient, ECR, and have to be able to keep on with their research. So the water project was adapted to sediment biogeochemistry and that student has now become really quite an expert in a host of new techniques that he never thought he'd have to get into on sediment speciation, SEM, electron microprobe work, XRF, and has become hugely competent in, at assessing synchrotron data from two successful grants that he, ha he helped to make happen. The beekeeper, she designed a whole new smaller better exposure system that needed fewer bees and significantly advanced what she originally had planned to do. The microplastics project was completely flipped on its head um, and this student developed and moved forward, complete, really advanced her methodology so that she, when she could get, get out again, she could hit the ground running. And she's also finished off a literature review beautifully to be published and it just has been. So these are just some of the examples of, of what, how We've really had to be steady, flexible, adaptive, innovative and agile to achieve our research goals in sometimes seemingly insurmountable times with barriers that we didn't know how we'd get over. So I just hope that our experiences here in the New England um, can give the rest of the community some encouragement to keep calm and keep on keep researching on in these somewhat uncertain times. So thanks very much for listening to our, my sort of overview of my wonderful group working up here in New England. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Sue. Really appreciate any, that. Yes, yeah, so any and que questions and thanks for listening. Any questions for Sue? Oh, Sue, Sue, just to comment, I guess, Tom Cresswell, um, thanks yeah. for that. It's a really, really nice to uh, to see um, that resilience. I think, you know, we've all faced faced that. And I, I certainly think that our students have come out um, really well, given the fact that, you know. Thanks, Lisa. 
Um, yeah, so as Lisa said, I'll be talking about some of the, a small subset of the results of some of the work we've done in my PhD over the last three and a half years, which has primarily been focused on the geochemistry and fate of arsenic and antimony in a contaminated freshwater system. And as Sue mentioned, had a couple of pivots all on the way there. So I'll start with a background to the system we're working in, which is the Maclay River catchment of Northeast New South Wales. So it's located roughly halfway between Sydney and Brisbane. And despite its relatively small size, it actually encompasses a really wide range of different geochemical environments and settings and also land use types. So the work we've done has been primarily focused up in the uppermost catchment in a small waterway called Baker's Creek, right on the edge of the New England tablelands but then it also extends down into the trunk Maclay just before it heads through the, the really high energy gorge system of the Great Dividing Range, where it's surrounded by national parks, out into the Maclay River Valley and the floodplains, which are predominantly agricultural areas, but are also where the bulk of the population in this catchment actually lives. So it's it's got a wide range of different geochemical settings, which makes the contamination issue in this catchment, which is the dispersion of arsenic and antimony, a really interesting one to investigate. So the source of that arsenic and antimony dispersion in the catchment is the Hillgrove mineral field, which sits just east of Armadale in a really heavily naturally mineralized zone. There's a lot of gold ore, antimony ore, and then associated with that is arsenic. So this area has been mined since the 1880s for both gold and antimony. Um, and back in the early days of the mining, it was a lot of hundreds really of small individual claims worked by just a few people. Um, and you can still see the remnants of all these old diggings and small tunnels in the modern day mine out there at the moment. So because it was sort of this piecemeal method of mining, up until the 1970s when a lot of these claims were consolidated into more modern operations. A lot of the waste was just being dumped back into Baker's Creek. So the waste from the actual mining, the, the excavations, and also the processing, the tailings, was just put back into the waterway. An estimated seven to 10 megatons over that time of highly con contaminated, high concentrations of arsenic and antimony waste was put into the Baker's Creek, which has over time made its way down into the Maclay River, leading to the current situation where we've got elevated arsenic and antimony concentrations 300 kilometers away down at the coast. So with that background, just to give a little more um, context to the results I'll be talking about tonight, I thought I would go through a couple of the original aims of the project. So one of the major things we were su supposed to be doing, as Sue said, was a, a full accounting of the water chemistry. but the, the amount of times we were able to go out sampling water was really limited because in the middle of my project, there was a huge drought. So that sort of got whittled back to just being investigating the modern day ongoing dispersion processes from this historic waste to see if it was still contributing in a significant way to um, ongoing contamination of the Maclay River. And if so, what processes were facilitating that dispersion in the current system? And then secondly, this was part of the pivot we made, was to identify the prevailing oxidation state of arsenic and antimony in the sediments right throughout the Maclay River. So the oxidation state of arsenic and antimony has a range of um, important effects on both the geochemistry, but most importantly, the toxicity. So the, of the two species that we typically expect to find in most sufficient environments of the trivalent and pentavalent oxyanions, the trivalent is the more more toxic and generally more, more worrisome of the two. So we thought it would be interesting to look and see if this wide range of geochemical settings of the catchment has affected the oxidation state and therefore the risk of arsenic and antimony through the river. So starting with that first investigation into the ongoing dispersion and the ongoing contribution to Maclay River contamination. If you walk around Baker's Creek during times of drought and low flow like that photo there, you can just pick up large chunks of stibnite, which is the primary sulfide mineral from antimony that was being mined at the time. And within that stibnite, it's full of arsenopyrite, which is the primary sulfide mineral for arsenic in the area. And there are just large chunks all over the ground that for whatever reason have been put into the water system 50 years ago, the river system and left there. 
So we wanted to know if this historic contamination is still contributing in a large way to the offsite movement. And if so, what is the process of that? Is it these large chunks are sitting there in Baker's Creek and undergoing this in situ um, oxidative dissolution process whereby they're releasing the dissolved oxyanions of arsenic and antimony straight into the water column and it's moving off site in that way? Or is it more limited to times of really high flow and high energy when you expect to have physical and mechanical breakdown of these really friable minerals and that's being carried downstream in the form of suspended sediments? So to do that, we took as many water samples as we could whenever water was flowing, essentially. And what we got from that was some interesting differences between the behavior of arsenic and antimony in the water column. So from a starting point of the sediment being the source, the ongoing source in Baker's Creek, um, there's actually not a great deal of difference between the arsenic and antimony concentrations. They typically range from about 70 to four or 500 milligrams per kilogram. But that from that, fairly similar starting position, you end up with a, a huge range of concentrations in the water. So we found that of all the samples we took, um, that the dissolved metalloid load far exceeded that of the suspended sediment. So for antimony, dissolved concentrations were typically about 50 to 100 times more than suspended sediment concentrations. And for arsenic, it was about 10 to 20 times more. So the dissolved um, form of antimony is really far more important in the transportation. And for every sample we took about 95% of the time, the dissolved antimony was between, between somewhere about five to up to 46 times greater than the dissolved arsenic concentrations. Whereas the suspended arsenic concentrations were generally between about five to 10 times higher than the suspended antimony concentrations. So we see there some, some differences in the um, the behavior of the two metalloids once they get uh, once they're released into the water column and that generally fits with what we know already about arsenic and antimony behavior under these sort of mildly alkaline sufficient well aerated environments so from our water samples we also did speciation analysis and of all the water samples i took even in the middle of the drought from small stagnant ponds we never found any reduced antimony never found any trivalent oxyanides Whereas in the, the middle of the drought, we did get some trivalent arsenic forming. And in, at times this did actually exceed the concentrations of the pentavalent arsenic. So then moving on to that second part of the work, which was to look and see if we could identify the metalloid oxidation states of the arsenic and antimony in sediments right throughout the Maclay River. So in addition to Baker's Creek, we added sediments that were collected spanning all of those different geochemical environments of the Maclay River. And we put in applications and were successful to send the sediments down to the excess beamline of the Australian synchrotron. So um, just on a technical note, we, we, we ended up doing the Zanes, so the near edge spectra, and taking known standards and went to we've gone the linear combination fit the fingerprinting route to identify our unknowns here so these images on the right just show that the the fits that we're able to get from our, our suite of standards we analyzed are actually fairly good and so we have some confidence in these results so starting with the arsenic first um, we found in baker's creek that the arsenic is primarily present as pentavalent sorption complexes this is about 70 to 90 percent of what the arsenic in these sediments are composed of. The secondary phase that we find is um, sulfur coordinated phases, which cor correlates with arsenopyrite, realga, those primary sulfide minerals. And that's a maximum of about 30 percent in some of those Baker's Creek sediments. We don't, though, once you get into sediments of the Maclay River itself, have any indication that those sulfide minerals have actually dispersed beyond Baker's Creek. Almost everything that we find from our scans of sediments further down catchment is pentavalent sorption complexes. And then as you move further down into the coast, the floodplains, those back swamp areas, you do start to find a little bit, some traces, minor traces still um, of trivalent arsenic. So for antimony, the results are fairly similar, actually. Um, in Baker's Creek, we again found mostly pentavalent sorption complexes. 
and then the secondary phase, the second most um, predominant phase was oxidized forms of stibnite, so oxidized minerals. And that mineral content does decrease significantly as you move downstream from the most heavily worked area of Baker's Creek, the, those areas where you can find the big chunks of stibnite sitting in the, in the creek. But we, didn't, we don't actually see any trace of stibnite in these spectra, which is interesting because it's everywhere there. And the only real explanation for that is that the stibnite isn't breaking down into the two mil sediment that we've sieved and used for this experiment. It's either sitting as sitting in situ as the big chunks you see when you go out in the field, and anything that's breaking off is rapidly oxidizing and dissolving. Uh, and then again, as we can move into the wider Maclay, um, it was almost entirely pentavalent sorption complexes, even in those places where you expect some intermittently reducing conditions to predominate, we didn't have any trivalent antimony sorption complexes there. So uh, in conclusion, um, we found that there is ongoing modern day dispersion of arsenic and antimony from Baker's Creek, the heavily contaminated section out into the wider Maclay River. And this is primarily in the form of those dissolved oxyanons. For antimony, almost entirely is pentavalent. And for arsenic, sometimes we see the formation of trivalent oxyanions, but only at low flow, so that may not actually be contributing to offsite migration anyway. On the excess work, we found that pretty significantly, we didn't find any primary sulfide minerals in the Maclay River sediments. So this suggests that even throughout the last hundred years of this problem, the primary um, offsite migration method from Baker's Creek into the Maclay River has been as those dissolved oxyanions, which then go on to form the sorption complexes we see from the Zane's work. So if anybody has any questions again, be happy to answer. Thanks, Stephen. Any questions for Stephen? Um, Lisa, um, yeah. Carl Bowles here from RPS. Um, given that the, um, the the drought is now broken. Um, is anyone going to do some follow-up work and see if the speciation might have changed now that you've got a change in climatic conditions? Yeah, that would that would be ideal. Um, I'm I'm almost out of time, I think. So it might be for the next oh, student I'm, or somebody. Yes, yeah, so I wasn't going to suggest you were going to add an extra <laughs> two years to your PhD. That would be cruel. And, uh, Stephen, it's Jenny Stauber here um, from CSIRO in Sydney. Just wanted to find out, oh, you didn't talk about the concentrations. Did you compare any of the concentrations of the arsenic-5 or antinomy, well, arsenic-5 at least, to guideline values to see whether that was a, a risk or a concern? Uh, yeah, in, in um, Baker's Creek, they they're exceed every single guideline value, essentially. So where we're working, the concentrations of dissolved arsenic and antimony can be up to a thousand ppb. So they're, they're extreme. Um, we've, we've done some other work looking at comparing them to guideline values recently and almost everything you can sample is above guideline values up in that area. Okay, thanks. Hi, Stephen. This is Diane Jolly. Um, I was actually, I've just sent you a question on chat. I'm actually quite interested to know whether in any of the work that you did on the sediments and waters, if you saw any association between antimony and carbon or arsenic and carbon in the system. Uh, we didn't look at carbon too closely, to be honest. It's something that if we could add it in retrospect, go back and do, but we were mostly trying to we had the, the water work, which was me running an AFS to do the speciation work, and the then the Zanes work, um, which, yeah, we, we, we didn't really look at carbon too closely. It's something that we've added in more recent samples, but we just don't have the database of material to really draw any conclusions from that at the moment. Yeah, sure. And, and I'm sure, too, trying to get samples for that for the synchrotron would be very difficult to access as well. So, yeah, but no, great talk. I really enjoyed that. Okay, we might save any further questions for Stephen until the, the end of our session tonight, uh, but we'll move on to something 
a little different with Carolyn Sonta looking at uh, PFAS. Thanks, Carolyn. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Hello? Yep, can hear oh, you, Carolyn. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to talk about um, whether or not PFAS are a threat to bees. To start with, I'll explain why bees are so important and what PFAS actually are. And then we'll look at two case studies to explain those further. Approximately 30% of food crops require insect pollination. And bees are the ideal pollinator because they have a hairy body and they need pollen and nectar. And you can see there in the picture a honeybee pollinating a raspberry flower, which is one of the ones that is essential, insect pollination is essential for. And honey is delicious. There's a global honey industry worth over 6 billion US dollars. There are actually thousands of bee species in the world and honeybees only form a small group of those. But honeybees are the ideal species for bee effect studies because they have a similar morphology to other bee species. They're easy to handle and rear. And so for those reasons, they're commonly the sacrificial lamb of the, lamb of the bees. So PFOS or perfluoroctane sulfonate is just one of thousands of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances known as PFAS. It's, they're all water soluble and they easily enter ground and surface water systems. There's 90 contaminated sites in Australia alone and there's thousands globally. Exposure routes to terrestrial organisms includes inhalation and consumption of contaminated dust and water. And PFOS out of all those PFAS is considered the most toxic to terrestrial organisms. And for that reason, it was included on the list of chemicals regulated under the Stockholm Convention of Persistent Organic Pollutants in 2009. So is the first case study I'm going to look at is whether or not PFAS was bioavailable to bees at a highly contaminated site. Now in the map there, and I'm not sure whether your screen has cut off the corner, there's a blue arrow on the east coast of Australia pointing to Williamtown, which is just north of Newcastle. And at Williamtown, there's a RAF base and there's also the Newcastle Airport. And from the 1970s through to the early 2000s, aqueous film forming foam was used for firefighting activities and training on a regular basis. And the key ingredient of AFFF is PFAS. The area is underlain by aquifers that form the water source for the local area. And it has a very complex hydrology. There's large sections that are marshland and large, large sections where the water table is almost at the same level as the, as the surface. So you can imagine that with the contamination, there's ended up being considerable and extensive PFAS contamination of ground and surface waters. And if you look at the table there, you can see some of those concentrations, which are just astronomical when you compare them to the quality, the water quality guidelines and the tolerable daily intake, and also what the ecological protection guidelines are. We don't know at this stage though, whether or not, um, or what the exposure routes actually are to bees. So the first project where we looked at, we used four test hives and you can see their locations there um, and one control hive. And the control hive was located well outside the flying range of bees from the contamination area. And that's the blocked area you can see there, the EPA investigation area. So over a period of 12 months, on a quarterly basis, we sampled honey bee tissue and honey from those beehives. And we had them analysed for the 12 isomer PFAS suite that's listed there. And that was done at the National Measurement Institute in Sydney by solid phase extraction and liquid chromatography tandem mass, mass spectrometry. And from that sample concentrations were calculated. So we had very interesting results because the PFAS in bee tissue and honey was equal to the concentrations in the control site samples which were less than the limit of recognition. 
So you can see Gavin there doing our analysis for us. Well, what does that all mean? Well, potentially plant nectar and surface water may not be exposure routes for bees. We need to investigate that more thoroughly before we can say that though. And also there may have been some dilution because there were periods of heavy rain during the sampling period and that may have impacted the result. So the second case study was my honours project. And in that I looked at the effect of PFOS on the colony dynamics of the European honeybee. For this, I used 42 bee colonies. So there were 14 in each replicate. There were three replicates. Each colony was a queen bee and approximately a thousand worker bees. And they were housed in a special cage system that I developed and you can see in the picture there with two bee colonies in each cage. And they were in there for five weeks. They had a week to get used to it. And then they had four weeks of PFOS exposure. And the concentrations we used ranged between 0.02 up to 1.6 milligrams per litre, which I know sound very high, but there are, believe it or not, places around the world where those concentrations exist in surface and groundwater. So a range of response metrics were measured. So what I tried to do was find things that would um, reflect whether or not a, a colony would normally be healthy and would survive. And I've listed those there. And there was a range of physiological and behavioural um, metrics that we looked at. So probably the most dramatic response was a physiological response of the queen's reproduction. So as you can see in those graphs, even though there were eggs laid in all of the concentrations, they definitely did get less at higher concentrations of PFOS. Then when we look at the larvae, which is the most sensitive stage of the bee's life cycle, uh, the larvae didn't really seem to survive too well. We had a few pupa in some of the lower concentrations, but then looking at the juvenile adults, only the control had juvenile adults that actually emerged. The other responses, um, there was a significant difference between the control and the concentrations in absolutely everything, except for gastric health. However, the controls were the only ones that didn't develop dysentery. So it kind of, I think that's worth investigating a bit further in the next project. The behavioural responses were very interesting. Um, what I found was their temperament and their activity, well, the temperament got a little aggressive at lower concentrations and they weren't particularly nice natured. But then at the highest concentrations, you wouldn't even get a buzz from those cages and they tended to just crawl around on the floor of the cage and they really couldn't do much. And as you can see in all of the things we looked at, um, like their ability to maintain the hive and pest management, defend the colony from pests, um, there was a significant difference between the control and all of the concentrations. And possibly the most dramatically was that PFAS, PFOS does transfer to bee tissue into honey and is eliminated in the feces. We just did a small sample on those, but it was, it was certainly interesting to see those results and I'll be exploring those more in my PhD. So what do all these results mean? Well, we do know from this that PFOS exposure detrimentally affects honeybee colonies. We don't really know the mechanisms that that occurs. We can only use examples from say other contaminants like um, pesticides to draw some conclusions. And it appears that the defense of the hive is impaired against pests, possibly from reduced olfaction, which is seen with neonicotinoids. Um, the colony survival is threatened from reduced movement, flying, foraging and colony care, because if the bees are unwell, they really can't do much about getting resources for the colony or caring for the young. And colony health is impaired possibly due to immune system stress, which is another thing that's seen with fungicides and pesticides. So where to now? Well, the next step is longer term exposure experiments at lower concentrations. And I'm about to start that experiment shortly. We need to determine how bees respond to PFOS exposure in the field. Can they detect it and avoid it? And I'm actually doing an experiment right now on that. 
And we need to develop ecological guidelines for assessment for contaminated areas with bees specifically in mind. And just incidentally, case study one has been submitted to environmental science and pollution research, and case study two has been accepted for the CTAC special series on PFAS in ecological risk assessment. So if you keep your eye out, you may be able to read those shortly. And just some acknowledgements and thank yous. And there's also my reference list. And if anyone wants more information on that, certainly feel free to contact me at my email address. Thanks, Carolyn. Have we got any questions for Carolyn's work? Maybe I'll just start with one question. Carolyn, um, you mentioned that um, you weren't able to see uh, PFOS in the honeybees that were, um, I guess, potentially feeding on nectar. But when you dosed the, um, the syrup, you were able to detect it in the honeybees. I just wondered, do you know if there are factors um, that may affect the bioavailability of PFOS in their natural diets that might influence bioaccumulation? I'm not really sure. There's been no evidence yet. I can't find any studies published um, that show that plants, even though we know plants do take PFOS up, whether it's actually in the plant nectar or in the pollen. Mm -hmm. um, and in the cages, they didn't have a choice. They had to drink what they were given or they went hungry. So that kind of makes me think that maybe either they don't like the taste of the higher concentration, so they avoid it or they, maybe it isn't available in plants. Maybe that's not even an exposure route. And maybe at the concentrations that is found in say surface water, pu water puddles, the dilution factor maybe means it's not an issue. But until we explore that further, it's really just um, supposition, I guess, at this stage. Does that um, answer your question? Carolyn <laughs> yep. and Lisa. Yes. Um, Carl Bowles here again, comment on that. So I'm, I'm aware of at least one other site where um, honey was sampled right at a, an area of pretty high um, uh, contamination. And again, there was nothing in the honey. Um, and I don't think it's a huge surprise because PFAS is taken up by plants, mainly as a result of its solubility and through evapotranspiration. And for it to get into fruit, it's, you've got to have xylem to flow and transfer. And I've probably got that the wrong way around. Um, but you need, you need transfer between the different vascular systems. And that's why we see much, much less PFAS in fruit than we do in the leafy parts of vegetables. And I'm guessing that flowers are like fruit. Unless you get that vascular transfer of PFAS, you're not going to see PFAS in that part of the plant. Uh-huh. That's interesting. And I am really interested in the other study. Do you know who did that other one? Um, so that was RAF Base Edinburgh. Um, so if you go to the Defence website and have a look for the detailed site investigation that was published for RAF Base Edinburgh, if you dig in there hard enough, you should find the honey data. Mm, okay, cool. Thanks. Good luck. Carolyn, I do have another question for you from Di Jolly, but um, we may need to save that one until the end of our presentations and come back to it. Um, so hope that's okay. Um, but thank you for your presentation. Um, we'll move on now to Nicola Forster, and she's gonna be telling us about microplastics from outdoor recreation. Thanks, Nicola. Oh, thanks, Lisa. Is that um, working okay now? Yep, that's, that's good. Thanks, Nicola. Cool, okay. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting a subset of results from my research showing that outdoor recreation uh, contributes microplastics to the natural environment. Uh, so, um, there's been a significant increase in outdoor recreation in conservation and wilderness areas in recent years. 
Um, for example, ultramarathons have increased by over 1,600% since 1996. And between 2006 and 2017, numbers of trail runners in the US have increased by 4.6 million and numbers of hikers have increased by about 15 million. We can also see this trend more locally in Australia where um, visitors to New South Wales national parks increased to 60 million in 2018 alone and trail running events some trail running events now have five to 6,000 participants. Um, so conservation and, and wilderness areas generally have few sources of microplastics other than recreation, but this indicates there's a significant amount of foot traffic and the pollution for, and the potential for microplastic pollution in what can be ecologically significant areas. Uh, so microplastics are plastic particles between one micron and five millimeters in size, um, but they can have a broad range of properties uh, varying in size, shape and chemistry. Uh, in terms of outdoor recreation, there can be a, a wide range of microplastics. Uh, this is because a variety of synthetic materials are used in clothing, footwear, backpacks, packaging and other items. Uh, so these microplastics may be fibers or fragments, and they can comprise a variety of additives and polymers, including um, polyethylene, polypropylene, nylon, polyester, uh, polytetrafluoroethylene, and different types of rubber. Uh, so preliminary research shows that microplastics have physical, biological, and chemical effects on solar systems with the potential to affect water flow, vegetation growth, and biodiversity. We recently published a review of these impacts in the soil in Geoderma, and this review really highlighted that microplastic impacts are closely related to particle size, shape, and chemistry. However, as we have limited information on the amounts and types of microplastics from recreation, we have a poor understanding of the implications of microplastics for uh, conservation and wilderness areas. Uh, so to begin to address this gap, we measured the baseline amount of microplastics on two popular trails in Armadale. Uh, these included the walking and running track at Jumeric Dam. And the other was the UNE mountain bike track, which is also frequently used by runners. Uh, so we studied two types of surfaces and the trails were also known to have different levels of soil carbon. Uh, so this study was part of a larger methodology study, which has been the focus of the first part of my PhD. So here you can see the two surfaces that were sampled. One is a compacted soil that's relatively free of material and the other was a loose overlay of soil. Uh, we took samples using a dustpan and brush. Uh, five samples were taken from the compacted soil and another five samples were taken from the loose soil overlay. Uh, at the same time, uh, we also examined recovery rates by spiking the trail surfaces with pink rubber microplastics. So the rubber outsole of shoes may be a significant source of microplastics on trails, uh, given they they incur the most abrasive force. Um, and we can see them wear down within a relatively short time frame as well. Uh, so for these pink particles simulated shoe abrasion and they were made by abrading a shoe outsole with a rotary tool and sandpaper. Uh, more detail on the spiking study and sampling techniques will be available in an upcoming paper. But microplastic studies uh, typically process soil samples using density separation, followed by digestion and microscopy. So we used a high density sodium iodide solution uh, to separate microplastics and the organic matter from the heavier mineral fraction. And we then digested the supernatant using 30% hydrogen peroxide and uh, viewed the samples under a microscope at a magnification of 30. 
So uh, a wide variety of microplastics were found on the trails, including um, fragments and fibres in a range of colours. The chemical composition hasn't been analysed yet, um, but the fibres are likely to be a mix of nylon and polyester uh, with a range of colouring agents. We were able to identify some of the fragments as rubber based on their uh, distinctive shape. And they were also elastically deformable when they were poked with a fine metal pin. So the, um, the spike samples show that a number of factors influence microplastic analysis. Uh, and this includes the trail surface, soil carbon, and the type of microplastic. So in the chart on the left, we can see that the recovery rate for the compacted soil was approximately 25% less than for the loose soil overlay. And in the chart on the right, we can see that the uh, soil carbon had a significant impact on recovery rates. Um, the soil with 0.9% carbon had recovery rates over 100%, uh, whereas the soil with 3.5% carbon only had a 19% recovery rate. So some of these samples had recovery rates in excess of 100% because the rubber particles tended to break up during processing, particularly when they were exposed to the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, we need to repeat spiking studies for other types of microplastics, uh, particularly fibers, to check if they're also prone to fragmentation. Um, needless to say though, these results indicate it's very difficult to quantify microplastics on trails. And we need to understand both the soil and trail characteristics before we can start to analyze and interpret the results. Um, so for example, here are the results for the detected microplastics as a function of soil weight. Um, these results haven't been corrected based on the recovery rates. And so it appears there's a higher number of microplastics on the walking trail, so the columns on the left. Um, but in the context of the spiking study, we know these results are heavily influenced by the soil carbon. And so the numbers of microplastics may actually be higher on the mountain bike track. We were better able to compare the numbers of microplastics on the different surfaces for each trail though. Uh, and in both cases, microplastic counts were higher on the compacted surface. So areas of the walking trail with compacted soil had approximately 1600 particles per kilo, whereas the loose soil had an average of uh, 100, uh, 1100 particles. And for the mountain bike trail, the compacted soil had approximately 1100 particles compared to 200 particles in the loose soil overlay. So um, microplastic research is still very much in its infancy. Uh, and so there are a few studies to which we can compare our results. Floodplains in Switzerland uh, had fewer microplastics than our study. There are approximately 115 particles per kilo, uh, and these were predominantly polyethylene. So this may indicate that trails are a hotspot for microplastic, um, for microplastics because of direct deposition. Uh, whereas floodplains mainly receive microplastics from diffuse sources such as flooding and wind. Uh, there may also be some differences because of our respective sampling strategies. There's only been one study in a wilderness area that has recreation, uh, and this was the Gallatin River that runs through Yellowstone National Park in the US. So this study found similar types of microplastics to our study, so rubber fragments and fibers. But unfortunately, we can't compare the uh, microplastic counts because these researchers only analyzed water samples. Um, it's also difficult to compare our results to other types of land use. This is because of a general lack of research and also because my microplastic results are very variable. For example, agricultural soils in China have been found to have anywhere from 78 to nearly 43,000 microplastics per kilo. So this would indicate that recreational trails can have just as much, just as many microplastics 
as an agricultural area that uses plastic sheeting and biosolids. Uh, further research is needed to really properly understand the distribution and extent of microplastic pollution in different landscapes. So just to sum up, um, our results show that recreation contributes a significant amount of microplastics to the natural environment. These particles can have a range of physical and chemical properties uh, and may potentially impact the soil environment and broader ecosystem. Uh, it's also clear that as recreation continues to increase in popularity, microplastic accumulation may accelerate in the natural environment. Um, thank you for listening and does anyone have any questions? Thanks, Nicola. Any no questions problem. for Nicola? Um, yeah. um, Carl here again, sorry to keep bogging the questions. Um, I'm interested, were the samples taken before the drought broke? And is it possible you could get a lot of microplastics building up over time under very rain poor conditions? And then subsequent to the drought breaking, would you expect to see the same number of particles? Um, I, I suspect that there will be a buildup of microplastics during a drought. Um, and then once it rains, it will um, it will reduce. But I think that will be very much contingent on um, you know every time there's a shower. I think there'll be microplastics coming onto the trail or different parts of the trail, depending on if it's on a slope or where it is. And there'll also be microplastics heading off the trail. Uh, but we're planning to do a longer term study uh, next year. And that will be something we'll be able to look at. Nicola, I was also wondering, um, perhaps in your study or the other studies you mentioned that have looked at microplastics in the wilderness, um, have people looked at um, the ingested microplastics in wildlife that are sharing those trails? And is that something that uh, you'll be doing in your study? Um, do you mean, uh, so for example, birds that have ingested microplastics and then transport them into uh, wilderness areas? I guess I'm thinking more about wildlife that might share those, those same trails. So for example, snakes or um, goannas that might be walking along those trails and sort of picking up microplastics either externally or ingesting them. Um, yeah, um, to the best of my knowledge, no one has looked at organisms like that. Most of the research has mainly looked at worms and nematodes uh, and smaller soil organisms. Um, there's also been some studies that have looked at uh, chooks and um, I think some studies have looked at birds as well, but I probably won't focus on animals too much. I mean, there's so many, so many things to look at. It's just a question of priorities. That is so true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nicola. Um, we might save any other questions for Nicola until the end of tonight's session. Uh, but now we'll move on to presentations from Southern Cross University. And uh, we'll start with Mandy. And uh, Mandy is currently in an area that um, Um, hi everyone. Hello, Lisa. Hi, Andang. Okay. Can I? Sorry. Can I start now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi everyone. I'm going to talk about the uh, pesticide occurrence in the Richmond River Estuary, New South Wales, Australia. This is part of uh, our study, I and Dang Jamal, together with Amanda, Rachel, Brissett, and Kirsten Beckendorf. And to begin this talk, uh, I'd like to tell you first why the study is important. So we all know that pesticides um, are used worldwide in agriculture to control pests, weeds, and fungi. And um, <clears throat> uh, we know also that um, 
pesticide um, have become um, an emerging chemical contaminants um, and being a global concern due to their persistence in the environment, um, bioaccumulation potential, toxicity to aquatic uh, biota, and uh, to human health. So given the widespread agriculture in the Richmond River catchment, uh, pesticide uh, runoff could be a potential source of chronic and acute contamination. Uh, Rosewater 20 and 10 report that that has been used around Richmond River estuary, and some of them uh, were used at high volume. This is uh, thought to be impacting Richmond River estuary health, and in the long term, could disrupt species interaction and Richmond River estuary. Uh, um, to date, however, uh, there is a limited information about pesticide contamination in the Richmond River estuary. Two recent assessments uh, conducting by uh, RMIT pesticide detective and by us last year, in October and November 2019, which is in dry condition, did not detect any pesticide in sediment as well as in estuary with limit of reporting less than 0.01 microgram per kilogram. So our study aimed to assess type and concentration of pesticide presents in water and Sydney coaster Sacostria glomerata in the Richmond River estuary after rain event with low level detection. Here is our study site. There, is, uh, there were six sites, including Emigrant Creek, Fishery Creek, North Creek, two sites at Empire Fells and Richmond River South Balina. And for uh, sample collection, uh, water and oyster we collected from January to March 2020. And for, oyster, for pesticide analysis, we um, pull four weeks water sample into one liter bottle. And for oyster, we extract five to nine individual oysters, uh, use acetonitrile nitril and quistial salt with ratio 111 and 10 milliliter aliquot together with the water samples were sent to ALS laboratory for a blood spectrum um, analysis of 100 sites and fungicide. And what we are found, uh, there were 14 pesticide types Sorry, Ndang. Sorry. Just um, need to let you know your audio is breaking up just a little bit. I wonder if perhaps you don't handle the microphone. So if you take your hand away from the microphone, that and might it, make things better. Is it not clear? It, it comes and goes, but perhaps if you don't touch the microphone, yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's fine. Is it okay now? It's good. Okay. So we've, um, so I repeat that we found 14 pesticide types, uh, six stick in water and 13 in oysters. And um, interestingly, uh, herbicide provazine only found in water, but another herbicide such as atrazine, the urine, hexazinone, metolacrylate, and fungicide binomial are detected in both in water and oysters. Um, another point, insecticide only found in oysters and uh, with another uh, herbicide such as flucropanate, pebulate, and vernolate, and uh, two fungicides for cetyl aluminum and aperdion. This is uh, the distribution of pesticide among study sites. We can see here that pesticide, pesticide types occur per site uh, between two and five types in water and seven and 11 types in oysters. And Empire Fire had more types in water, whereas uh, Richmond River South Balina had more types in oysters. Um, Another point is uh, we can see that the prevalence of atrazine, the urine, and methylacrylate um, 
are higher compared to other sites, which is more than 10%. And uh, importantly, that Artrazine not only found in water and oyster, but also in all of the study sites. In terms of concentration, we found in water, uh, pesticide concentration range between 0 0.02 and 2.98 microgram per liter, which the urine has the highest concentration in water. And Empire failed to tend to have a higher concentration uh, compared to other sites. Whereas in oysters, we found concentration from 0.11 to 20.38 nanogram per gram, where a fungicide for acetyl aluminum had the highest concentration. And it seems that um, the concentration between sites uh, were relatively comparable. And if we compare our um, sum of pesticides were listed in water quality guideline for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park 2010, we found that uh, some pesticides such as atrazine, hexazinone, metolachlor, and the urine has reached the threshold for 99 to 95% uh, protection for aquatic ecosystem without sublethal effect. And um, things to be concerned for insecticide chlorpyrifos, where, which uh, has very low um, threshold threshold value uh, would be a treat for uh, the sustainable for aquatic uh, ecosystem. And to conclude, um, herbicide is the most type of pesticide contamination in the Richmond River estuary and more types and concentration of pesticides in oysters than in water samples suggesting that Sydney rock oysters are useful biomonitor for some pesticides. And this finding provide baseline information on pesticide contamination in the Richmond River estuary and inform future ecotoxicological studies. Thank you. Thank you, Ndang. Do we have any questions for Ndang? I just can I just add something to Ndang's um, presentation? We really focused on understanding if we could detect any contamination in the Richmond River in that part of the study, and that's informing some ecotoxicological work that Ndang's doing. But um, in order to get those low levels of analyses, it's very costly and very expensive. So we brought in a process where we pooled samples over several weeks the collect, uh, that were collected over several weeks. And this, for us, over a wet season, this was, for us, was very useful in that detection process. Um, obviously, there's a lots to be done about measuring and, and so on. But when you've got a budget and you've got cost restrictions, I think we did well. And um, that's just a small part of one chapter of Endang's thesis. So well done and done, good job.